All right, let's start with uh, the most recent race. We're recording this not long after your race in Sydney. How was that? How was the event? How was your race? Mate, it was a cool, it was an awesome race. It, um, I think we had 5,500 people. It was controlled chaos, but they did a really good job. Ran really smoothly. Um, everyone had a great time. I I had a 50-50. I, my fir- the first half of the race uh, was great. I was, I was about 32 seconds, I think, of JK um, coming out of the burpees and just kind of turned off. It's almost like someone turned the light off. I think, I don't know if I underfueled or felt like a bit of an underfueling um, issue. Um, but had a great race until the burpees and kind of faded. I think I finished at 62 minutes. Um, I was still happy with that, but, you know, I'm kind of chasing that 58 sort of minute mark. And I think I've got that in my wheelhouse. I, I just, I just haven't been able to show it in the last two races. So back to the drawing board a little bit. And then we've got Brisbane in three weeks. Okay. Do you feel like, uh, I know um, I listened to you on another podcast, actually, and you were talking about how you were maybe planning on going out like harder and just seeing if you could hang on. Did you did you try that in Sydney and could that be one of the reasons? I did. I did push a little harder. Um, not much, just on the sled. So I took on the last sled effort, I, I pushed it pretty much right through. I pushed it four metres and then finished the last eight metres and – I did feel it. It was a little bit much in my legs. I don't know if that, you know, bit of extra effort was enough to kind of derail my race. Like potentially, potentially it could have. If I if I stop there, take the five, six seconds and then go again, maybe that's the right volume. I think I've kind of underdone the sleds before, just taken it a bit easy. Uh, I've always felt like I've paced those races well. But, yeah, I don't know if it was just too much on the sled push or – I maybe didn't feel enough uh, well enough in the days leading up, but overall, I was I was pretty happy with it. But I I just didn't run like my normal race, and I think I was about a minute forty off my normal running sort of time. And yeah, I just kind of I didn't I I didn't have the best race, but I mean that happens. And I think people go into high rocks now, and you know you pop a good race, and then the next one can just you know eat you up and and you know spit you out. That's that's the exciting thing about high rocks, you know. <laughs> Yeah. You think you think you have it kind of, you know, you think you've got this perfect plan, you think you've got it all figured out, and then it just kicks your ass. So yeah, that's what that's what keeps you coming back. <laughs> <laughs> Do you uh like obviously you're in Australia and and the season seems to be quite condensed there, like the events are happening now, really before the rest of the world. Uh, and like Melbourne was whatever it was only four weeks ago. Do you, do you wish it was a little bit more spread out so you had time for like a decent block in between those events or are you happy with how it is? I mean, it, it is pretty hard to do it, you know, a three or four week turnaround. We've I think we had four weeks between Melbourne and Sydney and then three weeks between Sydney and Brisbane. So, you've, you know, you're really recovering. You're trying to recover and get a two week. You're pretty much getting ten days in. You recover for three, four days, get a ten day block in, and then taper. So, it it is kind of hard, but I mean, I don't mind it. I, I guess it it would be nicer if you were in you know Europe or America and you had you know more races, more spread out. But I mean, we've still got four races this year. It's more than last year, and you know, if you if you want to make it to you know the elite, um, you're probably going to have to travel a little bit, but. I just saw everything come out with the whole new, you know, all the standards. I saw you write up about that and your best two races averaged over 365 days. So, yeah, I think it's a little harder for us over here, definitely. But, um, yeah, we've still got four races and it's, um, yeah, it's still a still a good time. Are you pretty happy with that new qualifying system? You, you think it's fair? I uh, I think I listened to a few of the podcasts with, with the owners talking about it and, I think it's definitely a step in the right direction for sure. And I mean, they're just, you know, they're just trying to create this and and create the best, um, you know, sport for the athletes. And I think, I think they're doing a good job. I think it's definitely better than last year. Um, it definitely makes it tough to get in, you know, with the auto qualifiers, but that's the name of the game. You know, you're not, it's, it's high rocks and it's a hard sport and there's some amazing athletes out there. So yeah, I think it's a I think it's definitely a good step in the right direction. 
All right, good. Um, let's talk about your background a little bit. So, you're are you a fireman still? Yeah, so I'm a firefighter. That's that's like my my full time job. And then on the side, I I do coaching and po- programming and uh, work out at a gym uh, okay. near my place. Okay, is the is the firefighter work like presumably like shift work? Is it is it quite hard training around that and fitting in? everything you need to do yeah i mean it's either it's either awesome and perfect and really easy because we do we do 24 hour shifts so we go 24 hours of work then 24 hours off 24 hours of work again and then we take five days off so it, depending on how the shifts are and how busy they are you're either loving it you're training on shift you got five days off um you know happy days you're gonna get nice and fit or you know, you might not sleep for 24 hours and then you're in catch-up mode. So it depends, you know, as as I've I've been a fiery now for 10 years, so definitely gotten used to the shift work and just adapting to it, you know. So if I have a really big, busy night, I'm not going to go and hammer myself the next morning. You know, I might take intervals off the table and I'll just do some zone two or some easy stretch. So you just kind of shift sessions and workouts as you need. Um, mm-hmm. Probably, you know, a lot, like people with kids and and certain things like that, but yeah, it's either awesome or you're just trying to put the fires out. What's Sorry, the fire. what's your presumably like you've got your like sleep routine down with that sort of shift work twenty four hours on and sleeping and I mean one of the reasons I ask is like people seem to struggle with jet lag to a certain extent in in high rocks and I wonder if it's like a similar. Thing. Do you have any sort of tips in managing jet lag, shift work, sleep, that type of thing? Yeah, you definitely, I think I definitely became more conscious of my sleep and better at catching up on sleep, you know, kind of sleep debt, you could call it. But naps definitely help a lot with sleep debt. Um, like I'll always try and get a nap on, you know, even if it's 15 minutes or 10 minutes, just not off while I'm on that shift. I know that if I get a nap the, the day of shift and the night's bad, the next day is much better. But I got one. I had one of those aura rings, you know, the the, mm-hmm. the trackers for your, for your fingers. That kind of made me very aware of sleep and like how much I was sleeping. Because up until then, I, I think, oh, yeah, I got two, three hours sleep. but Or I got four or five hours sleep, but it could have been one or two hours sleep. So next day I'm napping. I'm making sure, you know, everything's right using you know your, your eye mask your earplugs when you're napping and um just being conscious of how my body was feeling that next day of training um i think jet lag yeah there's a whole there's a whole host of ways to to mitigate jet lag and trying to acclimatize to the time zones before how many days you go over using things like melatonin cbd um i use melatonin and cbd uh definitely to help with mitigating uh, sleep debt after shifts as well. What's your optimal nap time? I know Hunter's a bit of a napper, I think, um, in, the, in the day as well, is it? Yeah. I mean, actually, when I was over, I went and stayed with Hunter for, I think it was about 10 days, two years ago. And he, um, he just put me up and he never met me. I think they, someone said, oh, you know, this guy's coming over from Australia. Can he, can he stay at yours? And he hit me up from the airport, put me up. And then he just napped the whole time. <laughs> um, no, nah, I know. I, to be honest, um, I think what the, I'm usually short and sweet, you know, get that 15, 20 minute power nap, or I'll just smash a whole 90 minutes full sleep cycle. Um, that's kind of like the sweet spot. If I've had a big night, I'll definitely try and get that big full 90 minute sleep cycle. You don't wake up groggy. And I think, some of the science says every hour you nap is almost equi- equivalent to two hours of sleep. So I think it's more potent. Um, so if you can nap for 90 minutes, you're almost getting three hours, but you definitely have to get used to it. So I think I don't really, I don't get jet lag. I don't really feel it too much. So I think that's probably from the shift work and being able to adapt to those, you know, different sleep patterns. Mm-hmm. All right. So, uh, Tell us about your sporting background. What were you doing before High Rocks? And I mean, I think you do some other stuff now as well. Still, are you, are you purely focused on High Rocks now? Or? Um, 
Yeah, so growing up, I I was soccer, uh, cross country, and tennis from an early age. But I think from the I was just you know every every any sport when I was young. I think from the age of about five, I was playing or oh, football. You call it football, don't you? Not soccer. <laughs> um, so football, football from the age of five. You know, you're playing that three days a week, and then cross. I picked up tennis about the age of eight and that was kind of my sport i wanted to i wanted to be a pro i wanted to you know be a professional you know play with leighton hewitt um and i was playing tennis every day probably probably six days a week from the age of eight to 15 and kind of got to that national level but didn't quite didn't quite have it so um probably from the age of eight or nine i picked up cross country as well so i was always a good you know cross country three to five k um 800 meter runner so i think you know from that early age i was just doing so much aerobic work probably more than now you know it's a it's weird to think that you know you could be doing a lot more back then but you know you're playing soccer or football an hour a day tennis two hours a day cross country three days a week so that kind of i think set me up really well mm-hmm. and probably started lifting weights at the age of 15 um i think i remember I think I was year nine at school and I um, had a summer holidays off, joined the gym, came back six weeks later and put like 10 kilos of muscle on. <laughs> People were like, nice. what, what's ha- what happened? <laughs> what did you get on? And uh, just those, you know, early gain, early gains. But yeah, I kind of fell in love with lifting and um, kind of studied it, read all the books, the textbooks and kind of became a student of that early on. So Played soccer or football until the age of uh, late twenties, and gave gave tennis up at fifteen. Kept running my whole life, and then when when football finished, I kind of fell into trail racing, trail running, and obstacle course racing, which was kind of the lead in to you know the stadium races at Spartan. Um, I went over and raced a few of those against like Ryan Kent. Um, so I met him a few times before the high rock scene. Um and that kind of led into into high ops. Okay, and <clears throat> I know recently you've been uh well you you were going for the Murph World Record. Is that is that still on the yeah. cards? Is that still something you're looking at? Um, so that came about just because of I think it sort of came around with COVID because high ops was starting to kick off pre COVID. I went over and had my first taste of high ops against. I raced Hunter and Kent. So I remember the first race in Dallas. And I think I I went 102 flat. I think Kent was about 80 seconds ahead of me. And then Hunter was about four minutes ahead. And I remember that race like vividly. That kind of got me hooked on it. But then COVID came around, couldn't travel, kind of stopped it all. And I'd been playing around with Murph a bit. And I think maybe speaking to Hunter about, about Murph got me interested and then started training for it and I went for it twice and actually tore my meniscus training in the lead up to one of the first ones um training for Murph and then ended up going for it twice and the second time missed it by 29 seconds um so I was I was I was pretty close and I I spoke I had it I had it all you know measured out the run had it all filmed. Everything was legit. It's on my, I think it's, I've got a YouTube clip of it um, so people could watch it. And I spoke to Alec, Alec Blennis, the guy who's got the record, and he said to me, he was like, mate, good work. He goes, if you would have done that on a truck, he goes, I think I think you would have gone close because um, I did it on an out and back. So ran out, did a U-turn, came back, uh, which probably slows you down a bit, but I don't know if it was 30 seconds. But that was that was cool training though. I mean, definitely set me up. I'm definitely, I'm definitely geared towards those big muscular endurance Murph style workouts. Um, and they just teach you a lot about yourself and you know where your weaknesses are. And it's just, I guess, something to focus on. There was no racing going on, so I thought I'll just try and hit this Murph world record. So, am I going to do it again? Um, I don't know. It's pretty painful, but I remember those. <laughs> Like that ten week, the ten weeks leading in when you're about to go for it is just brutal. Like you're doing, 
you're doing a couple thousand air squats and Bulgarian split squats and wall sits, you know, stair climbers. Um, it's it's just it's I, I enjoyed it though. So who knows? I might um I might have another crack. We'll see. All right, all right. Uh, you just mentioned stair climbers actually, and I was I was going to ask you about that. I think you've done a couple of like competitions. I don't know what you call them, like stair climbing competitions. Uh, and also, I wanted to ask you about. I vaguely remember this is probably over a year ago now, hearing you on a podcast, and I think it might have been the run in public, and you talked about. Uh, I think you couldn't run for a while, and you'd done a lot of work on like the the stair climber. And and you felt like it they, like really like held up your running abilities while you were injured. Is that is, am I remembering that right? Can you can you talk about that some more? Do you do, do, do you do yeah. a lot of training on that? Yeah, you're spot on. Um, basically, when I going back to um, like the stair races, we used to have like the firefighter stair climbs. So you're climbing a building of stairs maybe 100 floors, so you've got 1,500 stairs, and then you're climbing up with your, your turnout gear and your, your still BA cylinder. So you weigh about 25 kilos, and it's it's got this moisture-wicking, um, you know, sweat-wicking barrier, so it just gets exponentially hotter. So it's like 12 minutes of – it's the hardest 12 minutes I've probably ever done. It's it's the stair version of high rocks. <laughs> it's like <laughs> – it's insane. It's – yeah, you, your heart rate's through the roof. Like it's that perfect, you know, 11 minutes, perfect, you know, just past VO2, but it's like you're in a sauna. You know the point of a sauna where you're so hot and you're like, I've got to get out, and you do 30 more seconds and you're like, that's it. That's yeah. like two minutes in and then start doing burpees in the sauna. That's what the uh, <laughs> that, stair, that stair race felt like. But, yeah, I, I, I did this challenge and it was called Red Bull Hill Seekers and they had a challenge and I was on Strava. So Red Bull Hill, Se- Hill Seekers, max vertical gain in a month on Strava. So, I mean, I was, I had no business, you know, running big volume because I was running back then. I was pretty low mileage runner I'm running 30, 35 K a week. And a couple of guys started uh, joining the challenge and I actually had torn my meniscus. Um, this is in the Murph, the Murph time. So I'm coming back from meniscus tear, had the surgery and I didn't run in about four weeks. So I thought, oh, I'll do just an easy stair session. So did an easy stair session first day. I think I did 500 meters gain. Um, and it has to all be outside on Strava. You can, you can track it. So I did that. It was, you know, 45 minutes. Knee felt good. And I thought, okay, well, I'll try it again tomorrow. Did it again tomorrow. Normally I wouldn't go every day but this was a challenge so i was like all right let's see what happens and every dad has got a little bit more a little bit more um at this point there's guys putting down two thousand meters a day so they're putting two thousand meters day one two thousand day two you know they're racking up two thousand every day i'm on 500 at the start and i was like man i'm never going to catch these guys unless i do something stupid um but the knee felt good um and you know if you do a lot of um like hill running and you get your calves get beat up, your Achilles, your feet, your plants are like you, you can't really go and run three hours up a hill all day. Like you're gonna be booked. So this was almost like a cheat code for this stair climb for the for the elevation. So knee, knee was good. I kept going. Um didn't run once in the month, but I started to gain on them. And at so the, at the end of the challenge, the winner did 63,000 metres of vert. So I think it averaged about 2,000 a day. I came into the last week and I ended up finishing this challenge third. So my last week of the stair climb, I went, my last five days, I think I went 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 5,000, 7,000. That's meters each day. Like I almost climbed Everest on the last day on a stair on a staircase that was, I think, eleven meters high, and it was four, fourteen hours on this staircase. It's like I almost went insane. Like I had my mates with me, like at nine p.m. on this staircase, just up and down with me. You know, like they were just backing me because it was a it was a this cool Red Bull trip, and you went around Australia with one of these cool athletes. And I think I was so invested. You know, I'm. I'm three and a half weeks in and I got to this point there was it was almost like I'm I'm just gonna climb these stairs for 24 hours if I have to and I ended up I think I finished 300 meters short because 
I could only get to 7,200 metres on that final day. Um, I shouldn't have gone in for that last rest, I don't think, at lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, coming back after that, I coming back after that, I, I'd i run, I think I'd run seven kilometres in that month on, on flat ground, and I, I came back and I almost PB'd at 5K. Um, I just had this huge aerobic engine, and you think about it, you've done – maybe 100 hour, 110 hours of aerobic zone two work in that month. So that's 30 hours a week. And you just can't really accumulate that normally. And I just got this crazy boost and it's like I had this like another level. So I've always thought, and I've always thought this for Hyrox, you know, it's like I should just do like a two-week crazy stair block, just add it in. And I, I haven't done it yet, but I mean, some of the guys out there, it's probably, it's, it's probably going to take that to beat them, I think. Would you use like one of these, like whatever you call it, like stair mills in, in, in the gym to, to do that, to train on that? Like I, I definitely, I still, I'll still use a stair climber once a week, just as a low impact, you know, 60 minutes on a stair climber and you're getting, you know, you're getting over, you're getting over a thousand meters gain on that, but it gets pretty boring, you know, yeah, yeah. you got to put your YouTube show on, but I mean, I think, Honestly, if someone was going to go out there and hit 10 hours extra, like they could do their normal week and then just hit an extra 10 hours on this stair climber, they probably wouldn't over – their body would hold up and they'd get this crazy boost. But, I mean, who wants to go sit on a stair climber for, for 10 hours? <laughs> Fair enough. Um, tell us about your, your, your training, what your training week might look like. How do you set that up? Um, so my training, it's with my strength work, I kind of follow, I'm pretty sure, I think Sandy follows a similar approach with his strength work. It's like a West side conjugate, mm -hmm. um, strength approach. So you've got like your upper, you've got your low body strength days, your upper body strength days, and you're always rotating the lift and hitting a max, you know, one rep or three rep, lots of box squats and, uh, banded dynamic work. I'll hit a third strength session which is like a full body with power, you know, bands and chains. And then um, the rest is kind of um, just the conditioning work. So you've got got all your zone two work. Um, that's either running or riding or some stair climber. And then depending on where I am in season, I'll have like a VO2 uh, style session. So a track session could be, um, I'll usually start that with some, some short sprints for that high end speed work um look at that's that's looking at things like you know the anaerobic speed reserve so if my max sprint speed is is up here and my vo2 is down here the higher i can get my max sprint speed the easier it is going to be to hold that vo2 so i'm always making sure i've got some sort of max sprint speed in and that that track work might be 400s or, or k repeats or 800s and then i'll have i mean i've played around a lot with double threshold training and looking at, I mean, it's kind of the big, you know, buzzword in the endurance world at the moment where you've got to, you've got to be very careful with it because you're looking at people like the Inga Britsons who are running 200 kilometer weeks, professional athletes. So they're doing, you know, double threshold Tuesday, double threshold Thursday, all based off lactate. Um, I don't use lactate. I, I use heart rate and I've kind of extrapolated from, you know um, journals what the heart rate level sort of is and it's it's usually your lactate threshold minus five beats or minus 10 depending on the session um so i usually will have threshold running on a like lactate threshold running on a wednesday and then ergs and mixed threshold on a thursday so that's kind of how i do my like double threshold i'll do one on the wednesday and one on thursday so i get i get sleep and some recovery between it Mm -hmm. um but yeah it's i have practiced i have tried the double threshold on you know uh, on a tuesday and a thursday but i i felt it was just too much it was just too much volume for me so i in a, in a nutshell i'm trying to get that kind of 50 to 75 minutes of work at threshold some vo2 and then depending on where you're at the season um all the rest of the zone two work okay what sort of uh mileage are you doing running wise at the moment so now I'm sitting on sitting on about sixty kilometers a week. Mm -hmm. 
And I've slowly just been, this is the first year I've tried to up my mileage. So I, I, you know, historically I was always 30 to 30 to 40 Ks a week, which is pretty low, but I'd make up um, the missing volume in mountain biking, you know, stair climbers, ergs. So I was a pretty low mileage athlete. And this is the first time where I've, I've gone from that 35 K mark up to my new baseline now is sitting at 55, 60 K and I'm feeling really good there. You know, I took a few months to get there. The body's feeling good and my run time has improved, you know, out of sight, the biggest improvement I've had in the last five years. And as we know, like volume isn't everything, but if you can add more volume and stay injury free, you're going to get faster at running. Um, you just got to be smart about it. So will I keep going up? I don't, I'm not sure yet. I'll probably sit around 60 for a while and have all my other erg work and I'll probably slowly bring the ergs back up, right? bring my rowing back up. Um, and then if I need to maybe move up, I'm, I might try that. Okay. You uh, you mentioned your, like, your running times have improved. Where, where are you for, I don't know, whatever it is, a 10K half marathon, whatever you know? Um, so I, I haven't tested my 10 K or half since moving up in mileage. I was around 34, 40 for a 10 K and the half would have been around like a one eighteen. Now I think I'm, I'm going to test it. I just haven't been able to with all the races. So stacked, like I don't want to go and hit a definitely don't want to hit a, a half and a 10 is just going to, it's going to put me out of action. So I'll test them all probably in October. I think the 10 is going to be around 33, 40, and I think the half will be around 114, 115. Um, and that's just based on sections that I've hit lately. Um, so things like 5 by 2K at – I hit 5 by 2K at a 318 average with like a 90-second uh, job. And I hit five by four by four k um, at three thirty average with a one k bloat at like four fifteen. So I'm just basing them off those kind of workouts. So yeah, I feel like I'm in a really good place with the running now. I think I just need to bring back my ability to run off the stations and bring that new speed in with it. And I think I think I'll be in a good place. I, I, I was going to ask what you think it is that you need to work on to. You, you said like you, you think you've got 58 in you, for example. What what is it? Is it is it that ability to run off of the stations that you think is is maybe what will get you to that 58 level? Yeah, I mean, I I have focused this year on on my running, and it's every every metric has in, has improved out of sight. Um, like my ability to run an hour and you know aerobic thresholds through the roof now, but I think I have neglected a bit. Um, like the lactate clearance and tolerance work. Um, I used to do a lot, a lot of uh, lactate clearance tolerance work that um, I kind of learned of Chris Hinshaw. He was the coach of like Froning and Fraser, uh, one of the, like, the CrossFit like endurance coaches. I think I think he's have you spoken to him? Yeah, before? yeah, I've had him on here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he's a really good dude, and um, I got linked up with him. God, like five years ago and someone linked me up with him and I had a chat with him and he was a great guy and um, I've always loved his work but I saw a lot of a lot of benefit from doing a lot of his like five and ten minute lactate clearance and tolerance emoms um, and they're all things like I don't, have you have you seen much of his work on, on that stuff no no not a huge amount no so it, it's things like you've got a five minute emom um, for the first 15 seconds, you'll do a heavy goblet squat. So you'll do six heavy goblet squats in 15 seconds and you'll pick the weight. And each minute, you've got to hit five or six reps. So that always is the same. And then the 45 seconds, you'll do an air squat. So you'll build the lactate and then you'll clear it in the 45 seconds. So you, yeah, it's a heavy movement and then a light movement. So over time, the goblet squat will get a little heavier. You know, you might start around 40 and then at the end you've got a 60 kilo goblet squat. You've got your five reps and in the in the 45 second clearance time, your air squats will go from 20. So 
hit my five squats, hit my 20, and then I can hit my five again. So you might hit 100 air squats in those five uh, clearance minutes. But in the, down the track, you're now doing 50 air squats each 45 seconds. Your ability to clear lactate um, becomes a lot, uh, a lot more efficient. Um, things like also, you know, you do a Fran or you do a, you know, a 1K really hard ski effort. And instead of lying on the ground and, you know, wasting all that um, lactic acid that's built up, you can then go and do, you know, really light banded pull downs. So it's something to mimic the ski erg. Um, so instead of just, you know, missing that chance to use use all that waste product that's built up, you're going to do a movement that's teaching your body to clear it. So I used to do tons of that stuff. And I think with the running focus, I've gone away a bit from it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think I'm going to definitely bring that back in. Um, and hopefully when the two mesh, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get faster. It's, it's interesting actually, because I think a lot of people might typically think of like trying to achieve that is just purely just doing stuff that looks like a high rocks, like I'll go and do a sled push and then I'll start running and then, you know, backwards and forwards. But, um, you don't necessarily want to do that all the time. You don't want to necessarily run all the time and doing something like that can, can still work without maybe beating you up so much as well. I think. Yeah, it, it definitely doesn't, it definitely won't beat you up as much and it will definitely strengthen your tendons and your ligaments and your joints and your ability to, to, to do work. So if you're kind of smart with your programming in it, you can, you can kind of do anything you need to do. Um, you can do any kind of lift, you know, a squat, a hinge, a push, a pull, um, one of the most brutal ones for pulling I've ever, I've ever done, and it just completely wrecks my laps, is you go, this is more of a tolerance one. So you'll go five minutes, 20 seconds, you'll do um, heavy lap pull downs. You'll do 10 heavy lap pull down. You'll drop the weight, and then you'll do a 20 second isometric hold of the lap pull down. And then 20 seconds, you'll put it on a really light weight and you'll just clear it for 20 seconds. And then you'll go back into that heavy moment. But by minute three, you know, you feel like, yeah, your armpits are just getting ripped out of your sockets. Um, but those kind of workouts, they are, I mean, you think about that lat strength and that really that pulling strength, you can do that with any kind of, you know, plate bent over row. When you're on that sled pull or when you're lunging, just the ability to um, clear the, the lactate um, is just through the roof. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Uh, mindset, where does your mind go in the depths of a, a tough race i think um i use i've always used i use meditation for the last probably six or seven years and i, I found that that's helped helped a lot just by just with staying present and clear in the moment um i, I just luckily like to suffer so i mean any every everyone's human but most of the time i'm out there and um I'm enjoying it. I'm just, I've kind of pre-visualized the race. Like I know where it's going to hurt. I know how much it's going to hurt. So I'm, I'm kind of prepping my body for it. Um, so I, I know what I'm in for, but I think we're all human. And I think Sydney last, um, last race last week was the first time I, I was halfway through the race and I came out of the burpees and I thought, I'm never doing this again. Like I was, it, it was a, it was a weird feeling. Like I I hadn't had that. And, it was, as I said, it was like someone had turned the lights off, but that's racing and, you know, you're not going to hit every race perfectly. Um, and they're the, they're the kind of the moments that make you want to come back and make you want to train harder and make you kind of realise, you know, how it can feel. So you, you need those times in races. You need those injuries. They're, they're the things that are just going to make you a better athlete overall. You said you love hurting and... Again, I listened to you on a podcast recently. Sorry, I don't know the name of the podcast. Uh, but you said when you were a kid and you used to do cross country, you'd like run so hard you'd be puking at the end of it. Um, <laughs> like, where, where, where does that come from? Is that just that's always just been in you? I don't know. It's like I mean, I've done a lot of definitely done a lot of work. Like I'm 37 now, so I've definitely gone through those stages in life where you know when you're 25 you think you know everything but you don't know anything so I've, I've definitely been through those stages in my life and you know i've been through a marriage breakup I've, I've been through things where i've had to kind of go 
soul searching and you know look deep in myself and and find out what's in there and well, I kind of like I had I had, a, I had a great upbringing but I think my my parents split up when I was about seven or eight and I think I was at that stage of life where like it really like it it affected me and I never kind of addressed it as you would being a young kid and I remember I I kind of turned to like running and and really working hard and pushing myself it kind of coincided at the same time and there's a lot of studies on athletes and you look at some of like the olympic athletes and ironmen out there and they always say this thing about you want like the right amount of trauma in some of those athletes you know a lot of them are recovering heroin addicts and they've been through some some pretty heavy stuff but it's it's weird to think that that kind of some sort of trauma back then has led to your ability to enjoy that kind of pain because i think i used to for a long time use training as an outlet so i'd be sad especially when i was a kid you know and i'm eight years old don't know what's going on and i'm just like i remember going for runs and just just crying like just going out there and crying and that was my way of dealing with things for a long time i just have something wrong and i'd go you know i could have been 15 years old now 20 years old and i'd just go for a run and i you know you get all the endorphins and everything clears and you know to, did i didn't realize this until i was probably about uh, uh mid to late uh 20s and i was speaking to someone about it and um they kind of made me realize everything and now it's almost made me a worse athlete though because i feel like now the more self aware i get and you know I'm, I'm very happy in my life i'm almost like i'm not able to to go to that dark place as much in a weird point i i am but i think i was yeah i think i i was probably a better athlete when i when i didn't uh fix some of those things i, I wouldn't say a better athlete i think i think i now have the potential to get to a different level but yeah it's funny how you use things from your past and what attracts you to certain things but I mean, end of the day, you definitely want to be happy and content and you can use running. I think you can still use running and training as an outlet and as a way to clear your head. But I think for if, you, if you're using it all the time for that, I think that's definitely a, a sign to maybe, you know, ask yourself, you know, what, what are you running from or do I need to work on some of those things? Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um. What's been your best sporting experience over your lifetime? Anything spring to mind? Um, I kind of, I just enjoy, I enjoy every experience, you know. I think every time I, I've gotten to travel overseas or, you know, meet new people at at these races, you know, the Spartan Stadium races, um, the High Roxes, I think it's just, meeting meeting the people and I, I i love the training and i love the process you know at the end of the day the race is cool but it's it's the process and it's working out how to train to get there and and what works and what doesn't and you know constantly becoming a better version of yourself and then when you get into go to these races and meet people and you know i, I became great mates with hunter and you know we still we still chat all the time and I can't wait to go over and see him again. Oh, he's he's going to come and stay at mine soon, I think. But just getting to meet these people and, you know, they're very – we're all quite similar um, in a sense in terms of who we are and what we do. So I'd say definitely the people you meet and um, those experiences to travel are probably the best experiences I've had. Yeah. How about the toughest thing you've done? Toughest thing would be – I remember when I was, I was probably mid mid twenties, and do you remember do you remember the Tough Mudder days? Yeah. So they had the Tough Mudder, all those um, obstacle course races, and it was back when World's Toughest Mudder was really kicking off, and there was big prize money, and we had we had tryouts for the Australian Tough Mudder team, and Under Armour was was behind it, and. It was back when they were just throwing crazy money at everything and the branding, and you're like, oh, "Holy shit, I'm going to give this a crack!" But it ended up being like we went to our local running track. We did a five hour tryout, basically a five hour race with 
you know, running, pull-ups, all these workouts. Top two got through, went to the Nationals. So went to the first one, got through. And then the next one was this 30-hour just suffer fest of just the most brutal workouts that you've ever done. Like it started with a 50 a fifty kilometre trail run. So at hour zero, you ran 50 Ks. And then then that's, that's the first four hours. Then you'd come in, they gave you some chicken noodle soup, and it was just, you know, we did this, we had three hours of rock climbing. We had a four-hour like conditioning barbell session. Then there was another run. I remember this one workout in that 24 hours, and it was you'd hit you hit a burpee, run the length of a tennis court, burpee, and you did two hours, and it was max oh. distance. And we we I think we covered about 17 kilometers on that court. And I actually I got to I think hour 19 and got medically um, retired i done twist did something to my knee it wasn't serious i was out for about a month but i remember that being one of the one of the toughest you know i think endurance sports are mentally physically they're not as tough but mentally you just go, you just go to those dark places but i mean in terms of one race that i think is causes the most pain i think high rocks could be up there with what you know one of the most painful races that you'll ever do one of the most rewarding um but I think when you're riding that that line, that that razor's edge of just being at the perfect pacing where you're tipping over it, it gets it gets pretty tough. So yeah, a high rocks definitely would kick my ass, I think, more than most things. Yeah. When when you're starting the uh starting the day with a fifty K, just a just a fifty K and that's only four hours into thirty, like you know it's gonna be a tough old session. <laughs> And and when your longest run is fifteen k's, like <laughs> you, you just don't know what's going on. Yeah, you can't see. <laughs> um, all right, this is this has been great. Thanks for this. What's your High Rocks plans from now? Brisbane next, is it? Yeah, so we're we've got Brisbane in um on the seventeenth, so two and a half weeks, another ten days of training for the. Uh, and then Brisbane, then Perth will be four weeks after that. And then I think I'm just going to assess and see where I'm at. Like I need to hit, I need to hit two quick times coming up and then, and then we'll assess. I, I really want one really solid time in these next two races. Um, that'll at least set me up to then go and do another race as they're popping up everywhere. Potentially there's another one end of the year in Melbourne. So I'm just going to, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty f- fluid so i'm just going to see how these two races go and then we'll just assess from there okay awesome all right well thank you um if people want to follow you find out more about you and what you're doing you're doing some coaching as well do you want to talk about that a little bit yeah so um just yeah on my instagram i think i'm underscore chris woolley um put a link on that for the coaching we do and it's in collaboration with um, this big gym that I, i work out of and yeah, it's great. We've been um, running for a while now. It's it's kind of personalized um, hybrid style training, so it's it's similar to what the other people out there are doing. Um, you'll come in, get your program. You get a you get a face a call with me every two weeks, and it's just a personalized style hybrid program. Um, kind of based off you know I've been coaching for been a PT for 10, 10 to fifteen years, strength coach and um, programming for about ten years now. So it's sort of revolves around everything that I've done and learned and, um, you know, the coaches I've met and everything I've read over the last 10, 15 years. Um, yeah. Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for this. Good luck with everything. And I will talk to you again soon. Appreciate it, mate. Thanks for having me.